Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Sunday Messages. This is going to be a PTA episode today. For those of you who don't know what that means, it is the prayer, tarot, and advice column that I do. And full transparency, I have taken quite a bit of time off just to gather my strength, recalibrate myself. There have been a lot of things going on with my family, and so it's just required me to spread my energy a lot thinner than usual, and there's been a lot of space holding and a lot of conversations that I've had to have, and it's just been a very, very intense couple of weeks. So before I even get into these prayers, I would especially appreciate some love being sent towards my family right now and all of the situations that are unfolding. And so if you could just be in full agreement for the well-being of everyone involved and affected to be brimming, that would be greatly appreciated. Now let's go ahead and dive into these prayers. So if you're new here, the way that I do prayers is through agreement. So I'm going to say it in agreement format. And what you can do is on the other end of this podcast, you can just be in agreement for this thing to unfold. So I'm going to take a look at what people have submitted and then just be in agreement for whatever is of the highest good. Okay, so this first one is for Maite, and I'm in full agreement for the money, opportunities, places, resources, friends, and relationships that are of your highest good, greatest joy, and expansion to easily and effortlessly flow into your life in present time. I'm in full agreement for you to embody the highest expression of yourself and for you to be highly receptive to all of the goodness that is available to you now. Full agreement for all of that. Okay, this next one is for Joanna. I'm in full agreement for you, your partner, his family, and your family to be in the highest level of well-being and health, full agreement for overflowing well-being for everyone involved and affected, and for the highest good outcomes for everyone's unique individual soul in this lifetime. Full agreement. This next one is anonymous, and I'm in full agreement for you to find healing for your depression. And let me add a caveat to this. When I'm saying healing for the depression, what I'm really speaking to is I'm in full agreement for the density of depression to lift and shift out of your system so that lighter frequencies are actually available for you to hold within your body. So I'm in full agreement for that to shift out and also for you to have the internal structures and tools that are necessary for you to ride emotional waves. Because that's another thing when it comes to any type of anxiety or depression, the goal is not to stifle your emotional range, but really have the inner faculties to be able to navigate them as they come up. So I'm in full agreement for you to call in the right therapists, the right job, the right support, abundance, resources, and strength in order to move forward on this emotional healing journey. Full agreement. Okay, this next one is also anonymous. And it looks like you're dealing with a lot of responsibility and pressure coming from your family and your lineage. And there's a lot of confusion and not knowing what to do, so on and so forth. So I'm in full agreement for you to allow relief into your system. I'm in full agreement for you to understand where the boundaries exist between you and other people, for you to be able to identify those clearly and not go past or not not go beyond your personal boundaries and personal responsibilities in a way that is of the highest expression for you in this lifetime. So I'm in full agreement for you to experience more peace, more relief, and for you to be able to shift this energy out when it comes to the anxiety, the frustration, helplessness, stress, anger, all of that stuff. One thing that's coming through that I just want to tell you is I'm really getting that your system needs movement, P 
period, whether that's exercise, stretching, something high intensity, low intensity. It doesn't really matter. It could be shaking. It could be intense breath work. You need to actually discharge the energy from your system is what I'm picking up on heavily in this prayer. So I'm in full agreement for you to do that for you to feel into movement each and every day. I'm in full agreement for clarity, solutions, guidance, healing, and support to come into your experience and for strength to be something that is easily accessible and available to you and for the independence that you're evolving into to feel really supportive to your own system. One more piece. I know you you have something about wanting God to remove the loneliness, I want to tell you that's a trap. That's a trap because you're continuing to focus and go deeper and deeper into the fixation on loneliness. So you can't you can't focus on loneliness and shift out of loneliness at the same time. So you need to identify what a more supportive energy would look like or feel like in terms of what, what's the opposite of loneliness? Is it feeling connected, feeling supported, feeling togetherness, feeling the universal love, right? Point your attention and your focus in the direction of what you want, not what you're trying to avoid. So that's my final two cents on that. Okay, so I do have a submission for the advice column But there's a lot of different pieces that I actually want to break this down into multiple podcast episodes. So I'm going to answer part of this, but I'll definitely go in depth on this in the future. So for example, there is a question in this submission about receiving mode. And in my opinion, I think that receiving is its own topic and deserves its own episode. So I'm not going to totally go in depth on every aspect of this question, but I will answer it in in its entirety over time. So you're going to need to give me a little bit of time to do all these episodes because there's good stuff in this. Here's the gist. Here's the piece of this that I will be answering today. So I'm going to read part of this question and then I'll explain what I'm going to be answering. So here's the segment of the submission. Our childhood experiences feel similar to me. However, I took more of a people-pleasing and submissive response to the abuse when I was younger. And now I'm disgusted with myself for trying to appease my abusers. I feel angry, dominating, and rejecting of relationships but I'll swing from feeling needy to feeling repulsed. Attachment theory aside, I would love to hear you discuss the energetics of this. You're really gifted in this area of work and I would love your explanations. I'd like to hear more specifically on how I can get into a receiving mode to actually get these needs met and have healthy relationships. I know my neediness and repulsion is keeping connection away, but I can't seem to turn this human part of me off without falling into disgust with myself or others. I know I have responsibility to meet my own needs, but I also know that my human body wants co-regulation and emotional bonding to thrive. I would love to hear your take on how to turn this around because many of the traditional models of therapy aren't cutting it, and I hear this issue often. So let me explain a little bit of how the family dynamic works in order to create this type of experience. I'm going to be using an addiction model, an addiction structure for this example, because I think it's easiest to understand. So let's say you have one parent who's a codependent and you have one parent who's an addict. Now, what is going to be central to that family structure, if you have the head of a family, one's an addict, one's a codependent. The addict is going to act like a vampire energetically. So they are the central vacuum in the entire family. So they're going to pull the energy out of other people. It's just consume, 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 consume. That's the mechanics of what happens when an addict is in a family and people aren't conscious of how to handle it and how to approach it and how to implement proper boundaries. 
what I mean when I say the addict is going to endlessly consume is that the addict is going to be empty. So the reason why addicts take up a lot of energy is because they don't know how to keep themselves full. Now, on the codependent side of things, it's very, very similar. The codependent is also going to be empty because every time the codependent has a little bit of energy, they give it away to the addict, and then that breeds a lot of resentment. The codependent will not set any boundaries with the addict, and so there's endless energy that is going towards the addict to no avail, right? Giving an addict infinite energy will never fill the addict. If you think about the energetics of addiction more directly, think about it as someone who's dealing with addiction is going to have very leaky energy. So it's kind of like there's holes poked in their field, in their energetic field, so they can't actually maintain any fullness because it just leaks all over the place. So no matter how much they consume, all of their chakras are going to be popped open and they're going to be leaking all over the place. So that's why they they don't have any boundaries where they can keep their energy contained. And so it's just an endless black hole because they're constantly leaking. If you had a water bottle that was full of holes and you kept pouring water into it, it would be infinitely empty. And so the same type of thing is happening when you have someone with addiction problems in the core of a family, let's say. The codependent energetics are a little bit different. Someone who's codependent isn't necessarily leaky. It doesn't have the same type of holy structure. I don't read that in the same way. It's more of a voluntary emptiness. So you can imagine if you have a cup, a cup of water, and then you're just endlessly dumping it out. It's almost compulsive. Like they don't have very good control over just holding on to the cup and keeping it upright. They keep emptying it prematurely. So ideally, where you would be giving from is overflow. If you have an overflowing cup, it's okay if you share energy because you're still full. As soon as that cup starts to dip, that's where things like resentment, fatigue, frustration, bitterness, anger, that's where those emotions start to kick in because nobody is actually supposed to have an empty cup. None of us are. That's not how we're designed to operate. We want to operate from energetic fullness. So that is the dynamic that begins at any point in a lineage. You have one person voluntarily emptying themselves to a person with leaky energy, and both of these strategies are survival mechanisms. So don't think about this in terms of judgment, good, bad, right, wrong. Generally speaking, when I'm looking at stuff like this, I treat it more evolutionary. I try to take more of a biological bird's eye view to it so that I can get my ego out of the way. Because if I'm just coming from my own wound, then I can't objectively look at the energetics. So I do my best to take more of a bird's eye view of what's going on within the system. How is the system sick? And if you can take this objective view of the system being sick and you happen to have been born into a lineage with a sick system, then it helps to ease off of the disgust, right? Because the disgust piece is more than likely coming from the fact that it's very difficult to get a good control or a good grip on your, your evolutionary defense mechanisms. You know, it is, even if they're really, really dysfunctional or they cause a lot of damage, it's not easy to have full mastery over these parts of ourselves. It takes time, it takes diligence, it takes consciousness, and it takes a lot of internal will to get to the point where you have such mastery to the point where the old system isn't running you, but you're running it. 
So let's get back to this family system. If you were born into a system with this general dynamic, now without any healing or consciousness being brought to the situation, the parents are automatically going to pass these dysfunctions down to the children. And there's different ways that this can show up, right? So one possibility is that it's so dysfunctional that the adaptation ends up being to numb all feeling. And that's how you get an addict, basically. Another way that it can turn up is through like personality disorders. So this is actually what happened to my dad. The environment was so toxic and so horrific that he couldn't actually learn how to empathize with others. So with the lack of empathy and not being able to see outside of himself, it developed a really thick narcissistic structure. So the personality disorder has made him a shell of a person. So not only does he have addiction issues, did he learn how to cope through numbing, but he also can't see beyond his own experience. So he can't relate to others or empathize with others in any significant way. So his emotional capacity is almost non-existent. Now in this message, The adaptation to this environment was to become a people pleaser, and more than likely, the codependent parent is the one who taught you to do this. Again, this isn't a hard rule, but the odds are that this is really where this came from. And the reason being is that I know that a lot of codependent people will project this really toxic lack of boundaries onto their children by telling them, well, you should deny and neglect your own needs for the sake of someone else in order for you to keep yourself safe. That's really what it's about. Codependency comes from an instability in the environment And then in order to keep yourself safe, you endlessly please other people so that you don't get persecuted, you don't get attacked, you don't get in trouble, so on and so forth. It's it's a distorted way of coping with abuse. Because in reality, it doesn't matter how well behaved you are, you're still going to get abused at the end of the day. So basically... You have a family system where instead of focusing on yourselves and taking care of yourselves and maintaining your own sense of well-being, you have people who are emotionally manipulating each other and abusing each other to conform to whatever idea they think will keep them safe or comfortable or feel good. Because everyone is leaking or voluntarily emptying their cup, and so then it just turns into a giant clusterfuck through and through. Now, of course, there are so many different ways that people can adapt to an abusive family, but I will say the two most common ones that I see are codependency and addiction. Those are definitely the bread and butter of toxic families, in my opinion. And when I say addiction, I don't just mean a heroin addict. I'm talking about workaholism, um, food addiction, eating disorders, and then, you know, substance abuse. It could be a whole variety of different types of addiction, but that is one of the most common ones. So, Of course, the nitty-gritty details of an abusive family will really determine how you cope. So, for example, my family, I was never rewarded for good behavior, really. And also, no matter how much abuse or manipulation people tried to put me through, it never got me anywhere. I would still get abused, and it really didn't keep me safe. So, the, the purpose of conforming to other people's needs or giving other people what they want or trying to make people feel good really didn't serve me at all. And so people pleasing was not a functional adaptation. It wouldn't work in my environment just because the abuse was so horrific. So just understand when it comes to the lineage that you were born in, the quality and the type of abuse that was endured, 
the traumas that were had, the personality that you have, your soul's purpose in this lifetime, the archetypes that you chose to tango with. This is ultimately what drives our coping, is it's a matter of, well, what are we here to do? What are we here for? And your soul already knew what type of adaptations you would develop based on the lineage that you chose. Because for each and every type of adaptation, there's also gifts. Like if you are a people pleaser, if you do have codependency, I know a lot of people who are codependent with really big hearts, who are really tender, who are really loving, who genuinely care about others. It's not all bad. It's not like just because you have dysfunction or toxicity or harmful patterns in your system, it means that there's no wisdom or gifts or golden nuggets that come from those experiences. So one of the things that I'm hearing in this message about feeling disgusted with yourself is also not seeing that there's two sides to the coin. This will be much easier for yourself if you can start to see your own adaptations with compassion rather than judgment. Because if you can see yourself as having a system that kept you safe for a really long time, and it did, it kept you alive, it, it allowed you to exist in the environment that you were born into and in the lineage that you were born into, it adds an element of neutrality when you start looking at it from that angle. Again, try to put a biological and evolutionary lens on this whole thing, or if you prefer a spiritual lens, that could help to neutralize it as well. But the way I see it, no matter how dark or dysfunctional or toxic the adaptation, there's utility to it until it becomes destructive. So you're at the point now where the coping mechanisms are now destructive. So you have to shed them, you have to release them in order to get to this next iteration of yourself. So that's all that's happening. It's not that you're inherently bad or that this is going to lead to your ultimate demise. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. It's just that you are conscious of the fact that you are no longer tolerant of the old way of being. The disgust is simply the way that your body is communicating with you, that it's done with that old program. So if you didn't feel that disgust, you wouldn't be inspired into the new experience. See the disgust as communicating with you. It's wisdom that's coming through. It's notifying you of what's no longer working. And while it kept you alive in the past, it's giving you information. So again, the less judgment you have about what's happening, the better it's going to feel and the faster it's going to move. Now, I am going to leave you with two final pieces of what you can work on right now that will be helpful for where you're at in the process, okay? Because one of the things that I'm hearing is I I really do want connection and relationship and all of that stuff. And rightfully so, we're social creatures. We love connection. We want to love and connect and play with each other. That's something that we're here to do. But there is kind of an order of operations that you want to go in. And so I'm going to share that with you. First, before anything else, I would become a master at telling people no. Practice saying no in the mirror. I'm saying practice saying no literally, the word coming out of your mouth. Look at yourself in the mirror, say no, hold the energy of no in your body, feel what no feels like. And also, anytime you have an opportunity to set a boundary, you need to take it, particularly in the beginning. If this is a muscle that's weak for you, then you want to make sure that you're flexing it as much as you can, as often as you can. Not unnecessarily. I'm not telling you to say no to things that you want or that you want to do or that you want to say yes to. I'm saying if there's a ping of no that comes up in your body, you need to take that as practice and act on that 
as often as humanly possible because the more you do it, the better you're going to get and the easier it's going to get over time. Now, the second piece of this is I know that connection is what you're after, relationships are what you're after, totally understandable. But where you want to start is by getting really, really good at keeping yourself full. So before you take these skills into a relationship, you want to play in a sandbox first. And the sandbox that we have is our own being, our own vessel. Right now, if you prematurely go into relationships without working on keeping yourself full, you're going to inevitably fall into codependency. The reason being is that that program is going to be dominant until you start writing another one. So just understand that what is most comfortable for you is going to dominate until further notice. So for the time being, play in the sandbox, feel into your own needs, just tune into what is it that you need on a day-to-day basis and give that to yourself. Even this practice can feel really daunting for people because it's not something that we're taught when we come from abusive backgrounds. We're not taught to tune into our needs and actually focus on receiving that. So before you can actually be in an interdependent dynamic with someone else, you have to master it for yourself first. So you got it right in the sense that you know you're responsible to meet your own needs, And that is the bedrock of everything else. Because if you want needs to be filled by other people, you're already falling into codependency before you even enter the relationship. Interdependency and having high quality relationships will feel the best when you're coming from a space of overflow, not deficiency. And right now you're still operating from deficiency and then trying to get from other people. And that's where when you fall into that dynamic, the repulsion, the avoidance, the disgust is going to come back up again because you're mimicking an old system. So the most important piece is you want to get so good at meeting your own needs that the relationships that come into your life feel like whipped cream in a cherry. They're not things where you're operating from like your root chakra, which is going to keep you in survival and it's going to be really turbulent. If you're relating to people from your root or from that codependent space, all of your relationships are going to feel like a roller coaster. So this is not the time to go into attachment theory, in my opinion. It's not the time to focus on, honestly, it's not even the time for you to focus on relationships at all. This is a time for you to get really good at identifying what you need, get really good at filling that, get really good at self-mastery, and keeping yourself so full and so in tune with yourself That the relationships that you have only come from that overflowing cup, not an empty one. So that is the only thing that I would focus on if I were you. I would try to take your eyes off of relationships in general just for now, just for some time while you master this skill. And then you can start leaning in a little bit more and just feel out relationships as you go. Because this is, I don't want to say it's a big project, but it's a crucial one. It's a crucial one. You're not going to get away with slacking off on this because the codependency is going to be real thick for you. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that so that you can judge your experience. What I'm saying is that when codependency is thick, you have to be extra conscious But the feeling of codependency will be very, very clear to you when you get good at observing it without operating from it. For the time being, though, people who are just coming out of super codependent dynamics and are learning new skills, if you have too many relationships going on that are tugging at you, it's going to be very mm, foggy in terms of where the boundaries exist for where you stop and the other person begins. 
So that's why you want to take a break from focusing on other people so that you can fully feel yourself and your energetic field and that way you'll be able to catch the distinction between you and another. So that's the most important thing that I would recommend at this time. And I would also say watch yourself on consuming books and podcasts and anything about relationships. This is not the time to ingest a lot of content about relationships. This is time to focus on consuming content that has to do with self-love and self-mastery. So I would make that pivot as well. Uh, Don't bite off the relationship thing right this moment. So that might not be the advice that you want to hear, but that is my honest perspective on this situation so that you can have a really solid foundation to build on when you're ready to invite more of these relationships into your life. So I hope that helps and I will answer the other parts of this question more in-depth on other episodes. Okay, friends, let's pull some tarot cards for the week. Let's see what's going on, what you need to know. Ooh, three of cups. This is like a party card. It's coming through with this really strong celebration energy, but there's also, you know, friendships and community are coming through as well. Then we have the Nine of Wands and the Ace of Wands. Okay, I'm getting an uptick in energy. If that new moon that we had recently was kind of intense for you or if you've been feeling like a slump, I know the energy has been kind of foggy and dense lately, you know, for more than just me, but for people in general. And so I think that's going to be shifting this week. It's like, okay, you're coming out of the fog, you're feeling into energy increasing, you're going to have more stamina to get things done. But beware, beware, this is not about getting things done for the sake of checking off boxes. You want to make sure that the action that you're taking feels like it's in alignment with your soul, with your vision, with the things that you actually want to build. And so before you even spend energy, tap into your why, tap into your vision, tap into the version of yourself that you're becoming. And also make time for play this week. I think that's going to be really helpful for a lot of you to actually have fun, enjoy yourself, feel into pleasure and play and enjoyment, and just give to yourself this week and take the action that feels good and make sure that you are tuning in to the true desire as in the feeling state that you want to be in. So remember that all manifestations are actually feelings that you want to experience. It just so happens that we get to play and we get to bridge the 3D realm with the emotional realm and you're watching those two worlds intersect. So it's not that the house or the money or the car will deliver the feeling state. That's not accurate because we all know you can be miserable and drive a Ferrari. So it's not that the 3D is the necessary condition for the feeling state. It's just that what you want is the feeling state. So the more that you focus on that, the actions that are best for you will reveal themselves to you in that clarity. Okay, so if you're chasing something, tune into, okay, what's the feeling state that's actually underneath the manifestation and aim at that because that will get you there faster. So that's your cheat code for the week. And let me pull a Sovereign Oracle card. I've been loving these lately. You guys know how much I love this deck. Okay, offer. Speak up about your offering. Uplevel your inner story about the value of your work. Listen for what others are seeking from you, then deliver from a place of alignment. This is really bringing it back to what do you want to express in this life? What are, what are you here 
to do. And remember, think about this generally. Don't go into career necessarily because this is not specific to career. This is specific to what do you share with the world? If you think about your offering from that perspective and that vantage point, then all of a sudden it opens up all of these different, we could call them like micro purposes that open up. Because you being a good friend, you being open hearted, open minded, you having high quality conversations with people, maybe there's some art that you want to share with the world. You see, none of the things that I have expressed are necessarily rooted in career, even though for a lot of you that is what's going to be showing up this week is, yeah, what are you offering? Be really clear about that. Be explicit about that. Share that with the world. Yes, yes, yes. But for those of you who are not necessarily career oriented or that might not be the focal point for you, think about offering from a general perspective and then ask yourself, what energies am I offering the world? What am I contributing to the collective? Because that is going to be, one, reflected back to you. Two, that's going to be a creative force in the world. And three, that is what's going to bring you to the highest expression of yourself. Okay, so it's really about feeling into these potentials within yourself. Okay, my friends, that is all that I have for you today. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Don't forget, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you leave a glowing review for my amazing, wonderful, extraordinary content and this lovely podcast that I am so devoted to. And of course, if you would like to submit a prayer request or you would like to submit a question for the advice column, go to the description box or the show notes, depending on where you're listening to this or watching this or whatever, and go do that. Go submit that. And that's about it. I have a lot of other stuff that's going to be coming up. I will share in the coming days over the next few weeks. So make sure you stay tuned. Follow me on Instagram at rev.sydney.fin for even more magic. And I will talk to you beautiful people next time. Have a good one, everybody. Bye-bye. Everybody, bye-bye. Everybody, bye-bye.